good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see a big crowd of pediatricians. Um, and uh, I'd like to add my thanks to the organizers. This is a wonderful meeting to attend, and it's a wonderful meeting to get to speak at. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, so uh, the topic is an interesting one, and I'll admit right at the beginning that virtually nothing that I'm going to present to you today has um, any uh, pediatric data associated with it. Um, so take from it what you will. Um, my disclosures. So in thinking about the topic, um, I try to keep things simple. And I realized if what we, that there are a number of different clinical circumstances that one might consider um, in terms of when we want to stop anti-TNF therapy. So one um, uh, opportunity to stop therapy is, is when it stops working. That seems pretty obvious. Um, the second is when it's working, but maybe associated with toxicity. And the third is when it's still working. Now, I have the um, pleasure of being able to listen to Dr. Baldassano talk about the first topic, so we're going to just focus on the second two. So when do we stop anti-TNF ther therapy? Well, let's think for a minute about when it's working, but it's associated with toxicity. Um, and this slide summarizes basically everything I'm going to tell you about that, which is that I think we need to stop anti-TNF therapy when uh, we have a problem that appears to be um, complicated by the use of anti-TNF and for which we have evidence that there probably is a class effect so that switching from one agent to the other is not going to work. Um, there's fairly good evidence for a number of dermatologic conditions, including psoriasis and um, hydradenitis uh, suppurativa, uh, where there may be circumstances in which you can treat the uh, complication um, through ongoing treatment with anti-TNF, but in many patients, and in, certainly in, the, in a number of children that I've seen with, with bad, bad uh, psoriatic-like lesions, um, the only therapy for them is to stop the anti-TNF. Uh, in those circumstances in which you attempt to go back to anti-TNF therapy, either with the same agent or with a uh, second uh, anti-TNF agent, my own personal experience has been that the uh, lesions come back and the problem is very difficult. So I think uh, for that and for autoimmune disease, there's fairly good evidence um, including some pediatric case studies to suggest that, um, that recurrent disease is expected or persistent disease is expected with continued therapy, and so we need to stop. Um, those of you who attended the morning session uh, and heard some of the debates heard the debate about whether or not we need to stop uh, treating uh, with anti-TNF in the setting of lymphoma. Um, my own totally um, um, personal experiences that, which thankfully is quite limited, is that we had to stop. Uh, demyelinating disease I've not seen. The adult literature suggests that, that uh, we need to um, stop anti-TNF for that. Interstitial pneumonitis as well. The question of what to do in opportunistic infection is a little bit more difficult. Again, there's very, very little um, in the way of uh, data beyond scattered case reports. There is a suggestion um, that uh, for disseminated disease, you need to stop anti-TNF clearly, though, once the disease has been uh, successfully treated, uh, just like uh, we do with tuberculosis, uh, treatment with an anti-TNF can resume. Under most circumstances, the opportunistic infections appear to be primary infections, not reactivation of disease, so it does appear that once we've treated, it's safe to go back to the use of anti-TNF. So that brings me to the next topic where we'll spend a little bit more time is um, when do we stop anti-TNF in the circumstances of when it is still working? And to think about that, I think we first have to think about, well, why might we want to stop? Well, Ted has already alluded to the possibility of cost. And um, um, cost is obviously a very variable um, problem depending on where you are in the world and who's paying um, uh, for the treatment. Um, We've all had experiences with patients who have found it very difficult to manage the cost of these therapies, and we've had to consider stopping on that basis. I'm not going to spend much more time on that. Um, but patients also want to stop because either of an um, experienced side effect profile or for a um, uh, concern about the theoretic um, side effects that may come from these therapies. Saying that, though, the real question is, how many of our patients actually really want to stop? Um, uh, I'll tell you that um, often it's the parents who come to me with the question, can we stop therapy? And when the kids get wind of it, 
um, they don't want to hear anything about it. In most of the patients that we have introduced to anti-TNF over the years, it's generally been in kids who have been really pretty sick. And um, most of those kids don't want to go back to that, even when the parents raise the question. But I was able to find a study, this comes from uh, the UK, that um, interviewed a, a number of adults um, about the possibility of stopping um, uh, anti well, in this case, it was Remicade treatment. From what I understand, the, the policy in the UK is that Remicade can be used for a year, and if it hasn't failed before then, that you reassess your patients at a year to decide who needs to continue and who could possibly stop. So um, in this one paper, um, 21 adults who had Crohn's disease who have been treated for at least a year were um, interviewed uh, for the first question, which was, were they willing to consider being reassessed for the possibility of stopping disease, uh, stopping treatment? Um, and 38% uh, of them said yes, they were willing to have that reassessment. Most of those patients, um, when asked why they would want to stop their anti-TNF, cited issues associated with um, side effects, demyelinating disease, lymphoma, um, uh, infections. Um, but fully uh, two-thirds of the patients had no interest whatsoever in being reassessed. Uh, whether they had to be in the UK or not, I'm not sure. But according to this paper, most of these patients refused reassessment. They did not in any way, shape, or form want to stop their anti-TNF therapy. They were afraid that uh, they may get sick, they may need surgery, they may lose time from uh, work, uh, not be able to afford their ongoing care when they lost their jobs. So a significant proportion of our patients have no interest in stopping anti-TNF. Um, but are there patients who can stop? And for that, I wanted to show you um, a quick summary of a number of different studies from around the world. Um, uh, this first comes from Canada, looked at 48 um, adult patients who are on maintenance and fliximab therapy, um, all had a corticosteroid-free clinical remission at the time that the infliximab was stopped. Two-thirds of them were on, on an immunomodulator with either a thiopurine or methotrexate. Um, the median number of infusions at the time that the infliximab was stopped was eight, and the median duration of treatment, 15 months. So what was the outcome when they stopped um, the infliximab? Well, what you can see is that 50% of the population had a relapse by 15 months, and only 35% had a long-term remission off of infliximab. Now, you can look at that and flip it on its head and say, well, actually 35% of patients actually did pretty well and had a long-term remission even though they had stopped infliximab. So it does look like there are a, um, a group of patients who can stop anti-TNF and remain well for an extended period of time. Um, in this particular study, the authors could identify no clinical predictors um, at the time of discontinuation of the infliximab that predicted that long-term uh, remission. Another study, this one from uh, the Jetade group in France, um, looked at 115 adult subjects who had luminal disease and been treated with an anti-TNF and immunomodulator for at least a year. All, again, were uh, stable and had a corticosteroid-free remission uh, for at least six months at the time that their uh, infliximab were stopped, uh, and all had their immunomodulator uh, continued after the uh, discontinuation of the, of the Remicade. Um, median duration of uh, disease at the time of withdrawal, almost eight years. And what you can see is that the results in this population are fairly similar to the Canadian experience. 39% had relapsed by a year, 50% had relapsed by two years. In this particular study, they were able to identify a number of risk factors that um, uh, um, predicted um, an a, a relapse following discontinuation. Um, you see the factors that were, uh, had the greatest import were male sex, um, uh, being anemic at the time that the infliximab was stopped, um, having uh, an elevated CRP at the time that infliximab was stopped, and a number of other factors. These authors were able to demonstrate that they could um, develop a model um, that either um, incorporated, that's the complete model that incorporated uh, both a endoscopic uh, assessment and infliximab levels and a simplified model that left those uh, two studies out and were able to demonstrate that uh, the, the increasing number of deleterious factors could identify uh, patients who had the greatest risk for infliximab relapse. And in fact, they were able to simplify it simple enough for me to understand which was that if you were male and um, you had um, uh, not had a previous resection, that, um, that 
in this case, I'm sorry, in this, in this simplified model, they turned the risk factors on their head and these predicted um, uh, who had a lower risk of relapse. And so the, the males had a greater risk of relapse than the females, so um, uh, it took a greater number of good factors to put them in a good risk category for maintaining remission following discontinuation of Remicade. I'm sorry, a little bit backwards, but that's how the authors exp expressed it. Um, another similar study from Hungary uh, in, in an area where after a year you have to stop Remicade, 121 adult subjects who discontinued anti-TNF. Uh, this was a combination of both adalimumab and infliximab experience. Um, most continued uh, concomitant treatment with uh, a thiopurine. 45% um, of this group had to resume uh, their anti-TNF by a year. Um, and again, you can see some risk factors that were identified as predictive of who might uh, benefit or who might not benefit from a discontinuation of drug, fairly similar to the list that you just saw. So um, there was an austere group of um, individuals who were put together to try to answer the question, when do we dare to stop biologic or immunomodulatory therapy for Crohn's disease? These are the results of a multidisciplinary European expert panel. And um, their objective was to rate the appropriateness of stopping anti-TNF therapy um, in Crohn's disease patients who were in remission, and they used a, a standardized model that I cannot explain to you um, and never have heard before. But um, what uh, this group was able to dis decide was that if you're going to consider anti-TNF um, treatment in patients who are receiving monotherapy, that um, Patients should uh, not be considered until after at least two years of clinical and endoscopic remission or after four years of just clinical remission. And if you're going to withdraw the anti-TNF from combination therapy and maintain patients on an immunomodulator, that you could shorten that to after two years of clinical remission. Now, despite the austere group, there's a... Um, uh, review paper um, that's been published in the last year or two in the IBD journal, which um, I like to sort of summarize as, as, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which many of you may know is my favorite uh, therapeutic um, uh, paradigm. Um, and so in, in this circumstance, it is the author's opinion that 6-MP is a thiopurine and infliximab or anti-TNF treatment not be stopped as long as remission is maintained, cost is not an issue, there are no significant side effects, and the patient is tolerating treatment. A concern to stopping any of these medications is that treatments will develop, uh, is that patients will develop recurrence of disease or a complication that may make reintroduction of medical remission difficult. Similarly, we have concerns that by switching from one treatment to another, the patient's fu future medical options will be limited. Until new da data are presented, we suggest sticking with the horse that got you there and not stopping or switching immunomodulators or biologics that are working. So clearly the um, um, weight of evidence doesn't support one decision or another. So if we're going to consider um, stopping anti-TNFs in a patient in whom they seem to be working, who might that person, patient be? Well, I think those patients need to be in a deep remission, and a deep remission um, needs to be defined. Um, and um, in this particular study that I can show you, um, patients, uh, um, uh, there was a, an attempt to decide how often are patients who um, we evaluate who may be in clinical remission actually in a deep remission. And in, and in this particular study, um, deep remission was defined as no clinical symptoms and no endoscopic activity, defined as a uh, simple, simple endoscopic score for CD of uh, 0 to 2, um, or a Mayo subscore of 0 to 1 in the case of ulcerative colitis patients. Um, 67% of the patients who they evaluated were in a clinical remission, and 122 of those 168 were in deep remission by this criteria. So patients who are in deep remission may do well and may be considered uh, for discontinuation of their Remicade, um, but importantly, they should not have had a recent need for a dose escalation. They uh, um, are in a good risk category if they have low or absent trough levels at the time that you're um, uh, considering stopping them. Presumably in those patients, they've already demonstrated that they can come off drug without relapsing, longer duration of remission, 
normal growth and uh, an advanced Tanner stage in my book and willing to consider alternative therapy, the patients who don't meet those characteristics should not be considered for discontinuation. How do we treat after stopping? Well, to maintain remission, you can try immunomodulators, you can try enteral feedings, and in some cases, there are case reports of doing nothing. What if the patient relapses? Try restarting the anti-TNF. This is the one slide I stole from Jeff Himes' talk at NASBEGAN, which is a summary of, a, of an abstract that was presented about can you restart infliximab successfully, and the bottom line is, is that you can in a significant number of adult patients. We don't have similar data in children. Um, and there are a number of uh, predictors for um, um, predicting who will do well with this. If you can't uh, restart the anti-TNF, then you can consider an, another alternative agent with a different mechanism of action, and I'll leave that to the future uh, lectures to talk about our different uh, future therapies. Thanks very much.